Okay. So um, I asked you if you could um, look at this one example just as a practice to calculate the Fourier transform. So let's remember very quickly what the Fourier transform was. You see the integral. Here the function, the time function, is half a sign. This is an idealized impact force. If two completely elastic um, solids, one a half a sphere and a completely smooth surface collide, you get this kind of a force. And if you substitute here and do the calculations, um, we get the Fourier transform. What I want you to see here are a few things. This is a real signal. It's a real signal. It's a force signal. If you do this very simple calculation, very soon you see that the Fourier transform is a complex value uh, um, um, vector, let's say. And it has a real and an imaginary part. And of course, for a complex valued um, variable, you can calculate amplitude and phase. So that's where we stopped last time. The details of how to get to these numbers, if you look on canvas, they are there. So I don't go through them here. So let's then talk about these important things, which are the amplitude and phase of Fourier transform. I want to um, kind of summarize a few things here for you. So you saw that if we start with a time domain signal, let's say we can use Fourier transform to go from time to frequency domain. And when I say domain, it means that in the time domain, we write the signals as a function of time, t. In frequency domain, we write them as a function of frequency, which may look like omega, or we use f. And you remember from last time that the relationship between f and omega. So just as you saw in this example, the Fourier uh, transform is typically has one real part and imaginary part, even if your signal is real. What we care a lot about um, in signal processing and in acoustic testing is the amplitude, for example, of Fourier transform, which you know from math how to get it. So the real part of the Fourier transform is squared plus the imaginary part squared, and then you have to get square root. This we know. Something which is very, very useful, and we call it in, um, in this field, we call it power spectrum, um, is basically amplitude squared. So whenever you hear the word power, it's nothing else but amplitude is a squared. Um, of course, then the square root goes away. It's, it's very simple. So the real and imaginary, like that. Um, something which becomes very important in surface wave testing, for example, and guided wave, um, is the phase. Last time I used phi of omega, I do the same here. And that's, um, you know this probably already, but we just divide the imaginary to the real part. So this is, um, if you plot this, this phase will be between pi and um, pi over 2 and uh, negative pi over 2. Um, this we call it in, in ultrasonic testing, wrapped phase. 
And anything which is in frequency domain, if you are plotting something versus frequency, we call it a spectrum. So that if we plot um, phi, um, phi versus omega, that would be wrapped phase a spectrum, and it will go between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Now, sometimes we need to do something um, which we call unwrapping. That is, you go from zero to, you just add up the phase as you go um, further. You don't limit yourself between negative pi over two and pi over two. Don't worry about this too much right now. Just remember that you have heard about it. Um, we get back to that in surface wave testing. Then I say, oh, do you remember? We talked about this before. Um, Anyway, what we want to focus on right now is the amplitude of spectrum because that's kind of what we are going to deal with a lot more often. So whenever you hear just a spectrum, people are basically talking about amplitude of spectrum. Um, anything else, if it is power or phase, they're going to tell you. So I put it in. Parentheses, which is nothing else but just the plot of the absolute value of um, Fourier transform versus omega. You can, uh, most of the time in our applications, we actually plot it versus frequency. And I want to tell you a couple of important things about that. If we plot the, spectr uh, the spectrum, which means that you would, let's say if you, you go back to the previous example, if you plot the function that we got at the end, the amplitude versus frequency, you are going, let's say, to get something like that. Now, um, there are a few important terms here. One is um, a lot of times, let's say if you are looking at uh, a spectrum of a narrow banded signal, um, you are looking at the center frequency. That's um, kind of where you have a peak. And then something else which is important is this half power. So you look to see um, the maximum, let's say we call this maximum if you if you look at uh, where you are looking at 0.7 times the maximum amplitude so this is about 0.707 a max which is the same as um, one half of a max squared that's why it is called half power And then it turns out that this is an important concept. Um, typically, you look at those frequencies f1 and f2. And a lot of times, this is what the bandwidth is. You are not looking at um, going from 0 to whatever maximum. You are just looking at um, where. Um, you have basically more than half the power. The frequencies which correspond to more than half the power of the signal. Um, those are the most important frequencies. That's how I can put it. So um, we even have um, different definitions for this half power. So some people define it just the bandwidth. Let me write it nicely. Um, half power bandwidth. So you just look at how much. The, then the unit is kilohertz or megahertz or whatever. If you want to normalize it, you normalize it by the center frequency. Um, 
And later on, you see that there is a quantity which is very much related to attenuation, and it is very, we obtain it very close to what we do here. So if you want to express it in terms of percentage, you just um, normalize it by center frequency. These are the important things about um, frequency spectrum. So, now I want you to, um, if you're looking at the notes, please don't um, online, because I want you to, to think about a few um, um, examples of how do you think the frequency spectra looks like. So let's uh, start with with the example, just to gain some intuition, because that's that matters here. Imagine you have a very narrow pulse. Very, very narrow. This is the time domain. So remember, we use this kind of terminology. We say time domain, frequency domain. So how would the Fourier transform of a very narrow pulse look like? Anyone else? What does it mean broadband and a roof? Is it like that? No, it's like there is a bell curve, but spread is more. Okay. Any other ideas? So um, the question is, if we consider a very, very, um, let's even give it a, an amplitude one. It's very, very narrow. How would the frequency, um, um, in the frequency domain, how would it look like? It's okay, you just saw the frequency um, uh, spectrum for the first time, some of you, so it's absolutely fine uh, not to have the intuition, but it's important. If it's in the time domain, if the signal is very narrow, remember, in the frequency domain, it tends to be very wide. It's always like that. So now, this is the ideal case of really, really narrow. So in the frequency domain, if this is really zero, the thickness, the frequency domain, if I plot here, F, it will be just a constant. It won't be even a bell curve. What does that mean even? It means that every single frequency component contributes equally to make the spectrum of of something like that. Do you remember last time when I showed you this um, pulse? What did I tell you? Around the jumps, there were a lot of um, components being summed together to be able to get this jump. Here is the worst thing for Fourier series to reconstruct. It goes up and back down again. So it needs all the frequency components in the world and they all participate equally to reconstruct that in the frequency domain. In other words, the frequency representation is absolutely inefficient. It's horrible. It's much better to say, I have a pause at time t0, rather than to say, oh god, I have, you know, everything. But you can also think that, okay, if you know the constant and you know that it's continuous, that's also nice to know. But nothing is always so narrow. So if it is a little bit larger, it won't be a constant. It would be just like what Anurup was saying. It would be something, but very, very wide. So generally speaking, if you have a small pulse, 
your frequency bandwidth is going to be large. The larger your pulse gets, the narrower your frequency response gets. This is always like that. This is called Heisenberg uh, uncertainty principle. So the uh, multiplication of the widths in the time domain times frequency domain is a constant. So if you increase one, the other one decreases and vice versa. So it's a very useful thing. If you like math, if, if you like it, you can very easily calculate the, um, this constant. It just takes two seconds, so I just do it very quickly because it's always fun to work with delta Dirac function, I think, because everything goes away very easily. So let's just write it down very, very quickly. So if I wanted to calculate the, um, the frequency spectrum, I would, the frequency integral, I would just, now I have used this formulation when we have equal square root of pi. So if you remember, we have this integral and if you put the delta Dirac function, which would be the mathematical representation of a pulse, of course it goes everywhere zero other than at t equal to t zero. So it comes back as, as this. So the value since the value of the exponential is um, one, it would be just that. So it, it is, you see that it's a constant. That's what it is. Uh, depending on how you normalize your Fourier transform, Fourier integral and inverse, constant may be a little bit different, but it's a constant. Now, with that, the second question would be much more easier to answer. What if we have a white noise? What's a white noise? It means that it's just a constant with time. Some people use it to sleep better at night. Um, you can have a white noise generator in the room to sleep better. Um, how would this look like? in frequency domain, you think? Narrow? But where? Do we know where? Do you remember something about DC offset last time? What did I tell you about DC offset? So if you have a DC offset, so this is a very similar, another name for that, depending on where, um, which area you are looking at, is just having a DC offset. So what you can um, see is that a DC offset in the frequency domain will be exactly very, very narrow. Actually, in fact, it will be just one line and it will be at frequency zero like that now we don't care how much you can calculate it if you really like math I, um, but it's important and everything else falls in between so th remember the wider the signal is the narrower it is in the frequency domain and vice versa. Now, one more thing. This we talked about last time too. So if we have a sinusoidal, how would it look like in the frequency domain? A perfect sinusoidal periodic function. Exactly. Do we know where it is? So if it is f, exactly, um, it would be just 
omega 0 over 2 pi. Now soon you see a few other very important um, examples, but remember this here. Um, if you have something completely periodic or constant, which is somewhat uh, an extension of something very periodic, the infrequency you will be very narrow and vice versa. And everything else falls in between. Now, we want to switch from math to MATLAB. So basically, we want to switch from analog signals to digital signals, where actually we wanted to go there from the beginning, but I thought it's important for us to review a little bit what's, what we are looking at. Now, I guess you are all so young and you haven't ever seen an oscilloscope which is analog, but in the old times, have you? Have you seen one? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, it was like <laughs> they actually look very good. I mean, you see this red dot going? I'm not that old. I also have seen it at the corner of a lab, so um, <laughs> as a side note. But um, there is, I actually uh, saved one. I have one in my lab. I, I found one uh, at the corner, and I saved it just because I like it. And it works. Um, so they, 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 they used to have actually analog signals. And if you look at them, it looks very much fun. But most of us, or all of us, actually, we, um, we deal with modern equipment. So we deal with digital signals. So a signal which looks like that, actually, if you plot it without the line connecting things, it actually looks like that. So we want to understand a little bit how to do a Fourier transform with this kind of signal, um, what everything means, how we can control it. So I call this discrete analysis for obvious reason. I, should, I could have called this digital analysis. Um, so a number of things we need to know. And oh, this signal may look very familiar to you. From last time, this is the signal that some of you could not um, plot, some of you could plot. This is the in-contact signal. I'm just plotting the beginning. Yes? So let's see. We need to look at a few very important parameters and some terms. One very important parameter is the distance between two neighboring points. So um, I guess you all agree that this is just dotted. But um, the distance between two neighboring points, uh, which is very hard to plot here, is um, we call this dt. And I call this sampling interval. So how do we know that? I mean, where does this come from? This comes from the data acquisition parameters that you set when you actually collect this signal. Um, namely, it comes from something that you most of the time see as F sub S. So it's F sub S, and that's sampling frequency. And that's how many samples your data acquisition system can collect per one second. Rule of thumb is the higher this is, your equipment is better and more expensive, and everything takes longer. So that's kind of goes together. Um, I am old enough to remember that these were like in kilohertz range, and now almost every equipment comes in megahertz, 10 megahertz. Mine is now 250 megahertz. Um, uh, now it's much uh, cheaper and much easier to, to have that. So that's the sampling frequency. What's the relationship between, oh, for this particular signal, the sampling frequency is 50 megahertz. 
And then also we don't show the whole thing um, except from me or if you remember and hopefully you uploaded, downloaded the signal and you have it and so on. You, you know that each one of them has 10,000 data points. That's the number of data points. Now, what's the relationship between this sampling frequency and sampling interval? So if my sampling frequency is 50 megahertz, what is the distance between two neighboring points in the signal? No? Ryan? Exactly, it's just the inverse. It's very... <laughs> don't be afraid, this is nothing um, hard right now. So in this case, it's 1 over 50 megahertz. So it's 0 0.02 microsecond. Now, what else here? Oh, um, what is the duration of the signal? This is very easy. So we have 10,000 points. What would be the du duration? Well, um, it's 1 minus the number of points times dt. Maybe I can write this a little bit nicer. This looks bad. So duration of the signal, sometimes people, if the number of points are very large, people um, just approximate that because it doesn't matter. Um, but anyway, um, in this case, if you calculate it, you are going to get the exact value would be this, which is almost like 200. So another way to write this duration is of course to, instead of writing it with dt, you just substitute 1 over fs, you write it like that. I know it's um, intuitive, but it's good to, to write them. Let me see, I think I, I have everything about the time domain. Now, we need to know all these parameters when you want to calculate FFT um, of a digital signal. So what you see here is on the left hand side is the amplitude spectrum of this signal. So amplitude spectrum, remember we talked about this. That means the amplitude of the Fourier transform calculated in MATLAB for this signal. That means the x-axis is the frequency and the y-axis is the spectral amplitude. We don't want to uh, now uh, talk about the, um, that, but let's see what, how we can get this. So the, uh, my purpose is now to, to teach you how we can get this uh, spectrum. Okay, so if you look also very closely, you see that the spectrum is also, of course, digital. So what is the distance between every two points in the frequency domain? Does anyone know on top of his head? This is exaggerated. I mean to adjacent. That is um, not FS. That is called the frequency resolution. And How much is it? 
I could see it. So there is a very easy way to remember this um, for the rest of your careers, how to remember that if you forgot about it. If you consider any kind of signal, um, the duration of the signal, let's say, is T. The duration is, let's call it just duration. And then the distance between two is dt. These are the minimum and maximum time scales you have in a signal, which is not periodic. Do you agree? So one over the small dt kind of gives you the upper end of the frequency. One over the large duration gives you the lower end, which is the resolution. That's a very easy way to remember it. Now, it turns out that it's not quite like that, but we talk about it. Um, the frequency resolution is one over duration. Again, remember, in any signal, any digital signal, we have two time scales. It, it goes from the duration, the maximum, down to sampling interval. Okay. So the frequencies are one over that. So the largest would be one over the smallest. The smallest is one over the largest. That's, that's how you could remember it. Now remember, in the previous slide, we talked about duration. If you substitute, you get what would be the frequency resolution, which is very important. So it is, you can write it like that. It's just a number of samples minus one times dt, or um, don't be confused. Sometimes if the number of samples are very large, you, you may see that people uh, approximate that with just fs over nt. It's fine. So, how about the maximum? So our intuition tells us that, okay, um, this is the frequency resolution. That means kind of the resolution that you have. And the maximum then should be 1 over dt which is fs. However, this is not quite right. Why? Why can't I say that? So if I say that the maximum frequency in the spectrum is 1 over dt, I'm basically saying that I can resolve, I can, I can represent a, an event which is, you know, which is oscillating with the frequency corresponding to dt. This is not quite right. This is very uh, small to show you. Let me make a, a little bit larger sinusoidal. So let's see, this is a, um, this is the maximum that you want to have, the maximum frequency. This is the highest frequency feature you want to capture in a signal. Now, um, if you have, if you have three points over this um, little wave, um, which are like that, you are going to see something from the signal, but you are going to miss a lot of things. And even here, you see that this is dt, and it is half of the duration of this smallest wave in your signal. So the maximum, maximum, absolute maximum that we can go is not fs, but if we, it is um, half of fs, And we call this Nyquist frequency. That's the name of the guy who, who showed that. 
But remember that this is not really, you can be very unlucky. If your points are such that, let's say, the all three points are falling this way, you are going to miss the whole thing. So this is really the absolute maximum. Typically, you want to be um, F, uh, FS over 5 or 10. You cannot really look at that high of the frequencies and get accurate information. So most of the time, what we are looking at are far smaller than the Nyquist frequency. Um, when you are going towards Nyquist frequency, you are going to miss a lot of details in the signal, as you can see here. If I have the Nyquist frequency, and if I look at the analog signal of this, basically, I'm, I'm, I'm going to think that my signal looks like that, or it is looking like that. This is all wrong. So you, is, you have to have, let's say, a, around at least five to 10 points per smallest um, feature, the highest frequency feature that you have in your signal. So, so let's agree that we know now how to construct the frequency vector, okay? So the frequency vector you can uh, start from zero. You go in the uh, steps of delta f. That's what I've called here my frequency resolution. And we go, um, theoretically, all, uh, theoretically, we go all the way to fs over 2. But remember that in practice, you are more talking about fs over 10. You are not going to be able to use a lot of higher frequency content is just, um, it will be very inaccurate. Just remember these um, little demonstrations here. Okay, so how do we impl uh, implement this in MATLAB? Well, now we have, we know almost everything to do that. Um, in MATLAB, you can construct the frequency vector just the way I showed you. Uh, let's first write the version that I wrote you before and then I make it very digital. So delta F is Fs, let's say over n minus one. Of course, you need to define this previously in your um, in your work space, and then the function to use is called FFT, fast Fourier transform, and then whatever signal you have, you can um, just use that. Now. Yeah, that's, that's the um, easiest way. But remember that we want to look at amplitude spectrum. That means we have to look at the absolute value. So you want to look at the absolute of S. So at the end, if you plot F, and the absolute value of the FFT S, you are going to get your amplitude of spectrum. You notice that I have limited the number of um, FFT amplitudes just to one half. If you look at the details in the fast Fourier transform um, algorithm, which I have actually uploaded, one of the, those handouts, um, it tells you all about it. There are some fun examples. Um, um, I gave this as a lecture many years ago. Um, you can see that 
the FFT is actually everything is symmetric. So just plotting half of it would be sufficient. And then you are going to get the amplitude spectrum. Now, what I want you to do is actually to plot the spectrum. Now, with all this information, knowing that the sampling frequency is 50 megahertz, you have the signal, is in contact, um, try to see whether you are going to get the spectrum that I'm showing here. When I say spectrum, you need to have the correct frequency vector. And that's something very basic in this class. I want everyone to know Anytime you are getting a signal to get the spectrum with the correct frequency vector, you always have to ask the person who gives you the signal, what is your sampling frequency? The lengths you can figure out, just looking, just looking at your data file, you know how many data points you have. But you need to know what is the sampling frequency. If you have these uh, two information, then you should be able to plot a spectrum for any signal that you are given. So go ahead, try to plot this and see where. download and make sure that you get the signals before coming to the class. That's why. So we could just focus on
dot uh, the Fourier transform. So everything I I told you about how to make the frequency vector. So the satellite frequency is 50 megahertz. Let's make sure everyone is on the same page. So for this one, the sampling frequency is 50 megahertz. If you look at the previous uh, slide, and then the number of data points is 10,000. So. frequency vector and then um, get the FFP absolute value plus one versus the other. Depending on how you enter your sampling frequency in your um, axis may be megahertz, kilohertz, kilohertz. Thank you. 
So let's take a couple more minutes. from my sensors which are centered at one megahertz. So they're narrow band. If you go a little bit um, outside, then you go to If you want to practice, plot the spectrum of the other two. Okay. Thank you. 
Last minute, just the last day we work. Uh, that would be a scary thing. Now, um, it seems that most of you um, are now okay with this. I suggest that you repeat this for the other signal. Um, try to understand the steps. It's very, very important that at any time you can construct a frequency vector and make a spectrum. This is important. Um, Yeah. There are some details on the um, discrete Fourier transform. I skipped that. Um, please look in the notes. It's not um, too important, but it's good to know. Now, um, now that you are already there, you have this signal. What happened? You have this signal already opened up. Um, I want to, to talk to you about something else which is also important. And those are time windows. Um, what are these time windows? How do we apply them? What you see on here, on this corner, upper left corner, are four different windows, important ones. One is called Hamming window. That's the blue one. Very similar to that is the Hanning window, and then Gaussian, and what is called the box car, which may, doesn't look like a window to you because it looks like just a, a straight line, but it's actually a window. And what you see in the legend are the MATLAB commands how to get them. So if you make box car parenthesis 200, it gives you a 200 point box car window. It's the same with Hamming, Hanning, um, Gaussian. There are thousands of windows. These are the ones I think are the most important ones. Now, why this is important? Because a lot of times we need to window our signals. That means you 
just want to let some part of the signal through. You want to get rid of some stuff. Now, before talking about that, let's look at the frequency of spectrum of these windows. There is something very important here. So the colors match. What do you see here? What is the striking? We are looking at these windows, and we are looking at the boxcar window in time and frequency domain. What really uh, strikes you here? What should Yes. What is so different? The boxcar window, which is a rectangular window, that's another name for that, a rectangular window, when you look at it in frequency domain, do you see all those, um, what I would call side lobes? Going down like that? So, Going from time to frequency, if your window is very uh, smooth in the frequency domain, it looks very uh, smooth too. If you are just using a rectangular window, you are going to have a lot of side lobes in the frequency domain. And if you are windowing your signal in the time domain with this kind of window, you are introducing a lot of artifacts in the frequency domain because of these side lobes. So that's a big problem. And that's why it's not good to just cut your signal and go from one domain to the other. You are introducing a lot of things which don't belong there if you do that. Um, another important thing about windowing is how you apply the window in the time domain. So let me explain what these, um, this figure is here. Um, this is a hanging window, the red curve that you see here. It's a nice, a smooth window. And the blue curve is, is our famous in-contact signal that um, you all now have been working with. So if you just dot product the window with the signal, you get the one which is purple or magenta, the, the other curve. So that just um, very, very, it, it looks as uh, small because they are, are, are here. So very, depending on where this um, window is, if you use dot product, basically it multiplies amplitude by amplitude at, at uh, corresponding times, and you're going to get a very uh, small, tiny um, ripple there. Um, most of the time, what you want to do is a convolution. So the black curve is the convolution of the window with your signal. What is convolution is when you slide the window through your signal. At every position, you calculate the dot product and you go to the next um, position. So the code that you see to the left is the code to plot these um, different ways of applying the windows and examining it and playing with it. Um, please, at home, go and try this out. See if you are getting the same figures or not, if you get um, trouble or not. So this is about windowing. Now we are getting ready. Yeah. It depends on the application. Um, you see there are kind of different. Hanning goes to zero. Um, Hamming doesn't go. They are both being used very. It's uh, being better depends on the application. This is now the same length, so I'm plotting the same length of both. It, it depends on what you want to do, and there are many more windows. Like you can, but these are the the nice ones that we use. It's hard to say what is better than than what, but they are very similar. Um. So now we are kind of, that was an introduction to go to the next topic, which is also very important. And that is the time frequency representation. Um, this is very interesting. 
what you see here is actually a chirp. Um, so the way to make a chirp signal in MATLAB is just to use a command called chirp. But what is a chirp signal? Um, I don't remember why I have copied this two times here, but uh, a chirp signal is a signal where you can see with time the frequency is increasing. This particular one, the frequency is increasing linearly. So if you look from the left to the right, you see that the waves get more closer to each other. That's a chirp signal. Yeah, I mean, if you remember last year when the gravitational wave paper came out, this was actually a chip. I, I remember I actually showed this in, in the class. I was very excited. It was not um, um, shared by the student. I was totally excited, and everyone was like, okay, so. Um, but, so I didn't bring it this time. Yes, so. Yeah, just look at the PRL paper of uh, gravitational wave and you actually see a nice chip. That's one good example. So, um, but it's very useful. Uh, some of you um, have already used it. If you want to do a quick frequency sweep, um, that's the kind of signal you want to use. So if you want to sweep the frequency from one end to the other and see um, how your system is um, behaves at different frequencies, a chip is a perfect uh, signal. So the, but the reason I want to show it uh, to you here is that it's very easy to, to understand the time frequency based on that. Well, um, it turns out that we can look at the signal in time domain, in frequency domain, and then we can also look at it in the time frequency domain. So if we use um, a time frequency uh, representation based on Fourier transform, the chip looks like that. As you expect, the frequency is increasing linearly with time. This looks very, very cool. So if you look at this, if I don't show you the signal, you can see that here we have time, and here now we have frequency. And you see that you're looking at the signal with changing frequency content with time. So the frequency is increasing linearly with time. Why? Because I chose a chip in MATLAB which is linear. And you can see that it is like that. The frequency content is changing with time, meaning that this is the maximum peak. So if you cut at every location and you look at the frequency spectrum, so then you are looking from here. I have some examples for you. If you are looking from here, you actually see that this peak is advancing and it's linearly advancing. So at this is as if you have basically at every at any time you can look at the frequency content. Uh, it's not instantaneous. So I've used this spectrogram, and you take a window. So the way it, it works is you take a window. For that window, you window the signal, and then you get the FFT of that. For the next window, you get the FFT, and then you put them next to each other. This function gives you the option to control the size of the window and whether these windows have overlap. If these things are very abstract to you, don't worry. Um, come and talk to me in, the, in, in my office hours if you need more information, but you can also ask questions. So what it is here is that you get your signal, you have a window, one of those windows I showed you, let's say a humming window, and then you window it, you get an FFT. Then you move the window, you get another FFT. You move the window, another FFT, and you put all these FFTs together. When you do that, if you plot the center of each window here, and you have these FFTs, you are going to get an image. And it is called a spectrogram. So why do you look at it in the first place? I know you're trying to just look at the signal, but um, 
regarding have artifacts introduced that don't really understand why they wouldn't in that type of whole Because we want to see that. You do, okay. Yeah, so the the reason is if you just look at now let's look at the the other example. So this is the other um that is much easier to explain to This is the other signal. And of course I want you to plot this um on your own and to get the same image. But let's see what we are looking at here. Here is the signal. That's the velocity, US, whatever, that's the other one. Okay. Now, if I just take the FFT, I'm going to get this. To forget about this, I'm going to get this. All the time information is gone. So I'm just going from time to the frequency. In time domain also, I have no frequency information. So the idea of doing this windowing, and you're absolutely right that you, you um, have some artifacts. Even if then you are using a nice and smooth window, you are still manipulating your signal. Is that you get that. So for example, here you see that there is a frequency component, which is not going all the way to, and it's maximum between these time instances. There's another frequency component that you see here, but you see that there it is actually in your signal. So it's useful sometimes to be able to see where each frequency content is actually operating in your signal with time. That's why you go through this process together. And this is a very useful tool. Um, I don't know if you have ever used it. Abby, Peter, you can um, chat. No. But you may um, use it very well because it's very useful to, sometimes you just want to see what's going on in your signal. I know that Ryan has, has used this. So for example, in diffusion measurement, that's what um, we used it before. Yeah, almost um, out of time. This is the last thing. Um, so here, I want to show you something uh, very important about the spectrogram. And that is the influence of the size of the window. This is from a very, very old pa paper of mine. I don't want to say even when. Um, but if you increase the size of the window, so you are increasing the size of the window from here to here, and then you go there and here. So you see what, what is going on. This is the same signal. That's how the spectrum looks like. If you increase the size of the window, you see that the frequency resolution becomes better and better. I hope you see that here. So in the beginning, if you go instantaneous, your frequency resolution is really bad because you are basically just looking at one data point at, once, at one particular time. You don't really know what's going on. But then, as you increase the time, the frequency resolution is becomes better. The question is, what is the right window size? The answer is, no one really knows. It's a, um, it's a trade-off. You have to know what the frequency resolution you are looking for, and what you can live with. If you have two components which are so close to each other, and they are very low frequency, this is not going to be useful to you because they are going to be mixed up if your frequency resolution is less than a certain amount. So it all depends. But there are ways to do this better. I don't go through all the better ways, but I'll show you a few examples and just throw a few names in case later on you need to do something with your research to know that there are better ways to get time frequency pictures which, are, which have a better resolution in both domains. And here we are again limited by this uncertainty principle. So if you increase one resolution in one domain, you lose it in the other domain. And that's, that's what it is. Okay, I guess it's, for now it's, it's good. Um,